mostly the example of the music is of the United States of America. There's okay, they can have economic sanctions that they have. When they use the IMF to force Pakistan into changing their policies, a lot of people in Pakistan did not necessarily like what the IMF was doing. If you talk about Iran, when you talk about the economic sanctions that were placed on Iran for a while, the people in Iran did not necessarily appreciate what the United States of America was doing to them. Let's talk about military intervention. In the case of Pakistan, in the case of Pakistan, in the case of Iraq, you saw the rise of radicals because we feel that these people are more likely to react violently once you throw these ideologies, ideologies at them. So instead of liberalism being spread, liberalism spreading, what we've seen is a counterproductive result in the form of groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda rising because they garnered more support with this idea that liberalism is being thrown at them. And you know, we need to reject this notion altogether because it's another form of the West trying to dominate the East. And let's talk about progressive grassroots movements themselves. We feel that even those uh, movements suffer because of Western influence. If you talk about the Free Syrian Army, for example, they had a lot of support when it came, when it came to the Civil War in Syria. But once the United States of America openly started backing them, we saw a problem because people, it took away credibility from that movement itself because people started looking at it as an agenda of the United States of America to spread their own ideas in Syria. We feel that was counterintuitive as well. You look at thirdly, let's talk about uh, the uh, Afghanistani government and you talk about the Iraqi gov uh, government. You've got puppet, the puppet governments right now, and what you see again is that the people are not accepting, even though accepting the government, even though they're propagating certain liberal ideas, they say that we're not going to accept this because it has been imposed on us. And for all those reasons, we feel that you can't impose liberal ideas, vote for the government. I'd like to thank the speaker for the speech, and now I invite the leader of the opposition to deliver a speech. Now, please sit down. Liberal ideas are about the freedom to choose. And if we show to you that people within these conservative states, the status quo, in which liberal ideas are trying to get into, do not have that freedom to choose, then by automation we're telling you that it isn't in line with liberal principles, ladies and gentlemen. Because people within these conservative areas don't exactly have that freedom to be able to choose exactly what they want and what they don't want. Because everything that they are made to believe is backed up by either an authoritarian rule or some sacred idea that cannot be questioned. And why isn't it in liberal principles, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to go ahead and spread this message in order for people to go ahead and get these liberal ideals? And then they say that diversity is important because, you know, you need to have some conservative people in there. No. Liberalism rejects conservatism, ladies and gentlemen. Liberalism does not believe in conservative ideas, and hence, how, how diverse is liberalism after, after all, ladies and gentlemen? Liberalism rejects the one idea or the one facet that is not okay for you to be coerced into what you want to do. Then why is diversity important? Yeah. Why, for any reason, why does it need to exist under any circumstance? It doesn't. Because liberalism is the basic idea that you need to be able to choose exactly what you want. And if some people that sit down and don't reject Hassan, if some people are not being allowed to go ahead and choose this, then really Western countries with really liberalistic ideas have all the reason to go ahead and get it. And we believe that we don't exactly know whether or not these people have, do get that choice or not. And if we don't have that evidence either, then we still believe it's good enough to go ahead and go ahead and give these liberal ideas because we need to be able to make sure that these people have the right to choose exactly what they want to do with their lives. And then they talk about why it's bad. Well, thank you for Western states to go ahead and do this. We tell you that it's not necessarily bad for Western states to literally force liberal ideas down their throats because people there need this and people there want this. Yes, and they too. No, thank you. Because we think these people actually do need that freedom to be able to choose exactly what they want. And we tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that if resentment or backlash is a good enough reason for sure. you not to enact this policy, then by that logic, opening up will not go ahead and fight terrorists either because there's resentment and there's backlash. There's resentment yeah. and backlash in a lot of scenarios, ladies and gentlemen, but is that really a good enough reason for you to not do sure. something that you principally should? Which brings me very nicely, you know, thank you to the positive life extension of yeah. the as opening up this show. Thank you today. We're going to be arguing two things for you. Number one, why is the responsibility of the West 
to go ahead and do this. And number two, why it's important for these people within conservative areas to go ahead and get liberal ideas. But when you talk about the West, ladies and gentlemen, why it's their responsibility, we're telling this to you on two tiers. Number one, we'll be telling you exactly why it's in line with liberal ideals. Number two, we'll be telling you why exactly colonialization was something that was really bad and now they have a burden to fix it. Now let's talk about Western thought and liberalism, right? We're telling you very simply, ladies and gentlemen, that the people within these conservative areas are in a bad state, are in a bad situation, and Western countries have an onus to go ahead and fix it. Please. Why? No, thank you. Please sit down. We're telling you that by the end of the day, the most important thing in all of this is humanitarian action, ladies and gentlemen. And humanitarian action is not only what formulates Western foreign policy, but it's also what should formulate liberal ideas. That you should go ahead and be able to help people so they can choose exactly what they want to do. We're telling you that in conservative states, people exactly. do not get the freedom to choose. They don't get it at all and they don't get it against their will. So what I'm trying to say is, people are either born into these conservative states and by automation, they don't get that liberal exposure, or these people are coerced into believing that liberal exposure is something that is bad. Western countries, now thank you, consider themselves harbingers of human rights and consider themselves as people who are the paragons of excellence when it comes to liberal ideals have then a reason to go ahead and propagate this in terms of foreign policy, very simply put. But if you look at it, ladies and gentlemen, these areas in which they are trying to spread liberal ideals today are big places where there was colonization at one point in time. Take Pakistan, for example, ladies and gentlemen. Some Western countries, uniting them, when came in here, colonialized us and then went back, ladies and gentlemen. We're not okay with that because it left a very big vacuum for us to fill and in order for us to fix. They, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, no, thank you, left at a very bad time and left us in a state where some sort of religious fragmentation could have seeped in very easily and it did. And now we're in the state that we are today. The job was not only hard done, but the job was done very wrong. So these Western countries have a responsibility because of their what past actions to go ahead and try this through, uh, try and fix this through liberal ideals and we're all in favor of that. But before that, Sir, you're assuming that the reason why the problems appear is because these countries have gone away. Are you saying these countries should stay permanently within this third world colonial <laughs> countries in order for them? We're not telling them, so now we're not telling them to permanently stay. We're just telling them that if these liberal ideas can fix exactly what has gone wrong after their departure, then they should fix it. So if you look at it, so, uh, religious fragment, religious extremism seeped in after they left, and they left the job half done. What happened then, ladies and gentlemen? You need liberal ideas to counter it. Authoritarian regimes came in, you need democracy. The country. Women are now oppressed in these areas, and you need uh, you need women's rights to go and counter it. Homosexuals are looked down upon, and you need LGBT rights to counter it. You don't need these people to stay there, but you need yeah. these people have an onus to fix exactly what they cause wrong, and they need to do that because they are partly seeing why it happens. Yes, they have a responsibility simply because of their past actions. No, thank you. But let's talk about these people for a second. This brings me more towards exactly why this is in line with liberal principles, right? We're telling you that Western liberal ideas are more towards a single person's individual capacity being maximized to the fullest in whatever way he wants it to be. So these people within conservative states today, ladies and gentlemen, don't really get that option at all. We're telling you that it's not a liberal idea, it's not in liberal ideology to go ahead and leave these people, but be against liberal ideology if you do leave these people just standing. Yeah. Because we tell you, ladies and gentlemen, no thank you. So by the end of the day, that these liberal ideals need to be able to maximize a person's individual potential, which is not being able to be done in the scenario of a conservative state or in the scenario of the conservative state being there or oppressing these people. I'll elaborate more on this after this. So when did the people of Afghanistan or Iraq or Pakistan ask the US to come in and prove we're it? Telling you that these, we're telling you that these people, by the in a scenario where they're in an authoritarian state or a conservative state, which pushes them. We're talking about people like women who don't get women's rights. We're talking about people like LGBT uh, uh, homosexuals or lesbians who don't get these rights. They do need liberal ideas to come in because their choices, their life choices, are not being fulfilled by the conservative state in their day. It's not about every single person. People will be happy. Some people can be happy with an authoritarian state because they might believe in the state. Some people can be happy in a conservative state because they believe in conservative ideals. But a lot of people who need this liberalism in order for them to fulfill their life chances need that liberalism to come in for them. And that's why we think it's a moral obligation of the Western states who believe in the liberal ideal to come in and try and fix a situation that not only they wrong, but a situation that they have a responsibility to fix nonetheless. Because liberalism, which these countries believe in, simply holds the ideas that every single person should be able to maximize his life choices in whatever way possible. And we're telling you that if there are homosexuals and if there are women who need this, then by God, they should get it. <laughs> I'd like to thank the speaker for his 
speech. I would now like to call upon the Deputy Prime Minister to deliver a speech, not exceeding seven minutes in length. Funnily enough, the United States of America was a colony, ladies and gentlemen. So when you talk about the United States of America going in and intervening into other countries, their principle simply falls down flat on their faces because their primary principle was that you cause colonialism and hence you have a right to go in and intervene. America was a colony, ladies and gentlemen. It still has liberal values. So does most of Europe, ladies and gentlemen, without anyone going there and intervening within their matters. We think, ladies and gentlemen, liberalism is a fundamental idea that goes when you allow people to mobilize by themselves, not when you force it down their throats. Having dealt with that, now let's talk about the individual thing that opposition said. She said, he said, firstly, people don't have freedom conservative areas. Firstly, ladies and gentlemen, you cannot homogenize all conservative areas and say all people don't have freedom in those areas, ladies and gentlemen. We think most people in these areas do have freedom. Agency do have freedom. We think in Pakistan, women can vote. Women can even become prime minister, ladies and gentlemen. The same is the case for India, where Pratibha Pakistan were able to become the president. We think, ladies and gentlemen, side opposition the model only exists in a world where there is absolutely no room for change or progress within the current status quo. We think they have not shown that. That democracy has not flourished. That systems are not working. The second refutation to our, uh, our argument was that we don't have evidence to see whether or not there is liberal progression, which is why we need to go in. These countries are not your prototypes, ladies and gentlemen, that you go in there to find evidence, then come back out and say, oh, we have now found evidence, let's go in and stay there. We think, ladies and gentlemen, that's a ridiculous excuse to use that we don't have any evidence of liberal values, which is why we will go in, see for ourselves, and then come out and say, oh, we didn't find evidence like weapons of mass destruction, we've destroyed the country, doesn't really matter. The third idea that they had for you was the people need this. We think, ladies and gentlemen, the fundamental principle of liberalism is that when people need something, they ask for it. We don't know, ladies and gentlemen, when the people of the uh, people of Afghanistan, people of Vietnam, people of Iraq, people of Guatemala, people of Cuba, people of the Middle East ever ask for direct U.S. intervention, ladies and gentlemen, because we think what these people want is the ability to govern themselves. That does not mean Western liberal ideals being imposed or forced down their throats, ladies and gentlemen. This correlation never exists can not exist. The third idea that they have to use what we are doing is this in, is in the case of humanitarian action, ladies and gentlemen. Would they call Iraq a humanitarian intervention? Would they call Guatemala a humanitarian intervention? Would they call all these examples of countries where you went in for your own vested interest in order to establish a pro-capitalist government which you felt would be beneficial for your foreign policy interest as humanitarian intervention in order for the progress of the general people, not just of the ruling elite, ladies and gentlemen. We think no, side of the cannot classify them as humanitarian interventions, <laughs> so they cannot stand upon these liberal principles that they want to understand. The last idea that they have for this was that the problem is these people are born within these areas and cannot do anything. We think this is a fundamental problem. People can migrate if they feel the country is not good. You have immigration, except North Korea, we think most countries are generally okay with people going there. You have ideas of political asylum. You also have democratic change happening within countries, ladies and gentlemen, like Pakistan, whereby people are electing and changing political parties of their own coalition without any country having to go in and do that. India is the largest democracy in the world. It was a colony, ladies and gentlemen. No one had to intervene there. We don't see the link between you have a colonialization and all these principles that you're talking about. The last idea that they talked to you was, oh, uh, uh, talk to you was this idea of uh, this colonial, because you caused colonialization, hence you need to go and beat him, ladies and gentlemen, if you have been a bad parent, the way to correct that is not to go and beat your child up again and say, we have a responsibility, so we will go in. One form of fulfilling your responsibility is also not going in and intervening because you realize you have to be more responsible with your actions this time around because the first time around you went in, you caused a problem. We then, ladies and gentlemen, the reason why this power vacuum existed was because you went in and created it in the first place, ladies and gentlemen. These systems were governing themselves, but you disrupted them, created new systems. Now you want to go in, disrupt existing systems. We don't know what will happen after that. The only that I'll ask with those is those. World knows, we don't think that's reasonable for to live. I mean, have with all of that, ladies and gentlemen, now let's talk to you about our posture case parts, which we think are still not dead. We told you, ladies and gentlemen, that's fundamentally it's the principle of liberal values to go in and enter. We told you the first principle of a liberal state is minimal state intervention. The state allows individuals to decide for themselves. We think this principle extends to state state relations, ladies and gentlemen. No state can go in in the, in the face of another state and tell them what to do and how, how to have their foreign policy. The second idea we had to you, ladies and gentlemen, was this idea of 
a rationality that people are rational and after a certain point in time will arrive at the right conclusion. It took the United States of America 200 years after its inception to recognize gay rights, ladies and gentlemen. It took them 150 or 70 years to give women rights. Did anyone, did anyone question them, ladies and gentlemen? Did anyone try to force the United States of America to adopt liberal values? No, because you recognize, ladies and gentlemen, that true liberal values are allowing people to decide for themselves and arrive at this conclusion by themselves, ladies and gentlemen. I don't even know why you're not here. The third idea that we have to use for the versus idea of diversity. People within the United States of America are not all liberal, ladies and gentlemen. There are conservatives like the Republicans who live within the United States of America, who still reside by them, who still feel in conservative clothing, who still don't like homosexuals. We think, ladies and gentlemen, the primary principle of liberalism is not that you cannot have conservatism, is that every individual is on its own. You allow them to have their own liberal, individual liberties as long as they're not directly, tangibly harming anyone else's rights. We think this principle you're contradicting when you're going in another states and telling them what to do and how to live their way of life because you're encroaching upon their individual freedoms and their ability to decide themselves. The problem with all of this, ladies and gentlemen, is that no one takes your liberal principles seriously if you, as the champions of these liberal main principles, will not adhere to them in the first place. How do you expect the rest of the world to believe in that? We don't think side proposition model will do that. Sir. The second problem, ladies and gentlemen, is that it will always be counterproductive because the means that have been used, ladies and gentlemen, to, pro pro to uh, propagate these ideas have always been counterproductive, ladies and gentlemen. You went okay, with what? arms and overbearing oppression, I'll take you in a minute, o oppressive regimes in the case of Iraq, Afghanistan, which you have had this counterproductive reaction because people see this as a Western foreign invader mentality, ladies and gentlemen, and they want to push you out as soon as possible, which is counterproductive because instead of those people becoming more liberal, they become more and more radical, ladies and gentlemen. So we think imposing your values on other countries universally actually results in them rejecting them and disliking them even more. Yes, sir. Your speech has so far been about how you should allow people to choose whether or not they want liberal values. Do you think people in conservative totalitarian states are actually allowed to choose what they want? Yes, sir. Pakistan allows people to choose their own political parties. Ladies and gentlemen, in the, they have, we have my quotas for minorities and female representatives. Even in Saudi Arabia, ladies and gentlemen, you now have females being allowed the right to vote. We think change and liberalism is always a slow, progressive change, ladies and gentlemen. It's not always fast. The last idea we have to talk to you about is which one conception of universal liberal values will you espouse? Because we think, ladies and gentlemen, there is not even a single universal conception of liberal values to espouse in the first place. If we go about opposition models, the only one you can espouse is the US model of liberal values, which we think we've told you the problem with. However, if it is a mix and match model of liberal values that you want to espouse to everyone, we think every country will want their own aspects picked and choose, ladies and gentlemen. And when you're sending these values out to the third world or these developing countries, these people will simply don't know what the best form of liberalism or liberal values are which we think results in a lot of confusion for the identity of states that are not allowed to form them for themselves. We tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that true change only comes about when movements within those small states start and then form themselves. That's what happened in the case of the United States of America independence. People within the United States themselves <coughs> they wanted independence, ladies and gentlemen. For the simple fact that independence, liberalism, and rights can never be forced down people's throats. They always have to come from the people who don't open them <laughs> I'd like to thank the speaker for his speech and you would now like to call on the member, the deputy leader of the opposition to deliver the speech, not exceeding seven minutes. So ladies and gentlemen, we talk about the entire notion of how progressive liberal society should actually have these foreign policies which promote universalization of liberal values. We thereby need to accept this fact that these all values need to be taken into consideration in those places where religion is religion plays a great part in this level. Where religion creates this very sanctity and which creates this mindset in the people that they are not supposed to question anything because it's sacred for them to question it at the end of the day. They have to understand this fact that just because the mullahs or just because people which are ahead of the religion of the government have told them that they should be doing this so they are doing so and they can't help in the government because people's mindset is as is as rigid as anything in the government hence they aren't given that big option to decide and choose what's really right for them or what they think is right for them at the end of the day. Hence what you do, when, when they talk about how these Western societies do not have a right in imposing stuff. We believe that, ladies and gentlemen, that's eventually a very extremist approach to talk to one, ladies and gentlemen. We, may, we, we simply talk to you, we simply, uh, completely showed you as to how Western, these liberal ideas, which are pro being propagated in the Western societies, have a right to sit down on you. We have a right. 
propagated in Western societies, ladies and gentlemen, followers are present in other societies as well. But because of lack of representation, ladies and gentlemen, and because they so, fear, yeah. sit down, so because of the fear that they might get killed at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, they can't actually raise their voice. Which is why I believe that these Western societies have the every right to propagate this very liberal society, to propagate this liberal individualization, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, and so yeah. that sit down all of you, so that they could actually raise their voices and understand what they should really work for it. Moving on to the responsibility, why Western societies sit down there, why Western societies have a responsibility to do so. We believe that human dignity at the end of the day is being compromised when you're not allowing these very people to be uh, to act what they want, and when you're not allowing these people to actually raise their voices or to believe in themselves, they don't believe what is right for them. Hence, what you're doing is you're compromising on human dignity and on a path. Great part. No, thank you, sir. So, when you talk about how people should fly away or people should migrate at the end of it, we believe that you are thereby accepting this fact that, ladies and gentlemen, no, you are not being allowed to choose or you are not being allowed to follow what methods or the beliefs that you think are right. No, thank you, sir. What you think are right, ladies and gentlemen. Hence, you should actually go on somewhere else where LGBT rights for that matter, ladies and gentlemen, are being recognized. And people do so at the end of the day. People migrate to the United States of America because there is recognition for LGBT rights, ladies and gentlemen. Why? Because Eastern societies don't give them these rights. Why are they don't, uh, why aren't they giving them these rights, ladies and gentlemen? That is the question that this house has today. And that is the question, the answer to it, ladies and gentlemen, is the West, is the policy of these Western societies, no thank you all of you, is the policy of these Western societies providing a universalized form of liberalization to into these very countries, ladies and gentlemen. And then when they talk about, uh, when they talk about how people ask for such a change, ladies and gentlemen, we believe that people have this fear that they might get killed at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen. People are not allowed to raise voices just because it's considered to be haram or sacred, ladies and gentlemen, at the end of the day. Just because it's considered sir. sit down, sir. Just because it's considered non-religious to talk about how it's okay being gay, ladies and gentlemen, or it's okay being lesbian at the end of the day. Hence, what you're understanding is that if anyone raises voice for homosexuals in Pakistan or for Afghanistan that might uh, for that matter, ladies and gentlemen, they might get killed or get their head chops or uh, head chops off, ladies and gentlemen. No, thank you, sir. Hence, what we're saying is that everybody's for that matter in Pakistan, ladies and gentlemen, cannot really actually propagate that they are part of the Muslim community, ladies and gentlemen. Why? Because Muslim, uh, because the religion does not allow them to do so. Hence, what we're saying is that this very, these very circumstances in these very societies so, do not allow people at the end of the day to actually raise their voices what they want to do at the end of the day. No, thank you, sir. Moving on, ladies and gentlemen, when they talk about how they created, uh, the, the, when they talk about the entire notion of globalization, ladies and gentlemen, how the very notion as to this change was brought about in the United States of America. We believe the change came about when people or the head of state ladies and gentlemen realized at the end of the day that people want it. In these societies, the head of the state or the state itself does not recognize such things, ladies and gentlemen. The head of state is as ignorant as any and has not recognized this very liberalization, not allowing people to follow what they really want to do at the end of the day. No, thank you all. Moving on, ladies and gentlemen. With the positive case as to how and why Western policy oh, right. is, is, is the right thing to do so. No, thank you. It's the right thing to do so. We believe that diplomatic relations at the end of the day are very important, ladies and gentlemen. And we believe that the, the, these diplomatic relations will get better at the end of the day. How so, ladies and gentlemen? Because we believe when this, when this, when this, when this, there will be a formation of these blocks, ladies and gentlemen, at the end of the day, and there will be a formation of blocks having uh, having relations with other countries ladies and gentlemen having yes, allies sir. no thank you sir having allies having making allies ladies and gentlemen believe that this would inherently have better relations why because for example the Iran the US the nuclear deal for that matter ladies and gentlemen you have this economic trade agreement with both of the countries which helped them to actually make a good uh, to have, uh, to actually negotiate on the Iran nuclear deal for that matter hence when you have this such diplomatic ties ladies and gentlemen uh, being deduced, uh, deduced from uh, economic ties or such that we believe that the very uh, uh, goal is being achieved at the end of the day. No, thank you, sir. Hence, what we're trying to say is, ladies and gentlemen, is that the very idea or notion of the individualistic society, individualistic society at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, whereby every person should have, in a minute, sir, every person should get or should want, ladies and gentlemen, what he really or she really wants. Sir. How do you see? How have US relations with the Iraqi people changed since past post US intervention? Apart from having the rise of ISIS, how have the people in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Vietnam became more liberal? Alright, so you need to understand that when you talk about such political scenarios, you need to understand there's not one factor that's, been, that, that's affecting the situation, ladies and gentlemen. The mindset or that is being altered in, in, in Iraq, ladies and gentlemen, all these very people done by these, uh, by these Taliban or the ISIS for that matter, ladies and gentlemen. We believe that that is why 
There's not only one factor, which is why I said I actually blame America for all the matter of liberalization not, not being up for which is why I believe that such liberalization, when it would be carried forward, ladies and gentlemen, when such collective image of liberalization would be put forward, we believe a strong change can come about, ladies and gentlemen. And that's exactly why we believe that because the United or foreign, uh, foreign policies, the domestic foreign policies, if come together, ladies and gentlemen, and even universalized liberal values are being dictated upon, we believe that such change can come about at the end of the day. Hence, when we talk about this uh, by foreign policy, ladies and gentlemen, we talk about how we give examples of NATO blocks, ladies and gentlemen, from the end of the day. How you have this NATO block, which has a great role in actually achieving or actually having more negotiations, the better negotiations, negotiations with other countries, ladies and gentlemen. Why? Because they have this universalized Role, uh, universalized goals, ladies and gentlemen, and universalized ideas or values as to how they should actually negotiate. Hence, we believe that such universalistic ideas should be carried forward and liberal values should be put forward, ladies and gentlemen, and Western policies should actually portray such universalized liberal values so that people in our society at the end of the day could actually get their voices recognized. So, I thank you all. <laughs> The entire assumption that Team Opposition's case today was based on was that no individual within any country wants to live the way their state is forcing them to. We tell you that the people within Pakistan, even if 10% of them are not happy with the way they're living, 90% of them are, ladies and gentlemen. Does that mean you invite the United States of America to impose its different values upon them? We don't think that's even true. But moving on to what team opposition had to say to us today. Firstly, they came up here and talked about how you have these liberal ideas that people are not allowed to choose. We tell you that the reason why most people aren't going for these liberal ideas is because of the social economic factors that exist. So the reason why women might not get these rights that you pay down of mobilization within Saudi Arabia is because the mindset of the people is what will affect those women that go out. If a woman goes out, if a woman goes out, it is those people that will attack it, ladies and gentlemen, which is why your state does not do this because you realize that there is a harm present to them in the first place. But on the second level, they also came up here and talked about how people want to choose this way of life. We tell you that in most countries, you do have things they are these people electing who they want into power. You have those variety of governments that have different mandates, ladies and gentlemen. If they wanted to choose a government that has these different powers, different mandates, then you would have chosen them in the very first place. We don't think that's even a problem and not a need that even and the need that they pointed out for us was not even correct at the end of the day. But they also came up and talked about that there really is a problem that was there because the Western countries have been colonized us. But what was the solution that they provided to them? That you take these countries back, you have them impose the same values again so people start to accept them. You had Britain taking over us for hundreds of years. Did we accept them then? You will have them for 10 more years. Do you really think we're going to be accepting them again? We think not. But on the second level, we tell you that even if you want them to be liberal, liberal is something that comes from within your people, ladies and gentlemen. How is these values that are coming from the different side of the world even going to be coming from within your people? We think not. But we will tell you that if you think that right now these people are being forced certain values upon, then they will be even more forceful if they're coming from a separate country, ladies and gentlemen, from a government that they didn't even ask should have its authority over them. But fourthly, they also came up and talked about, this was very funny by the way, they said some people might be happy with authoritarian states that they're living with, but others are not, so you have to go in everywhere. We tell you that what is even the need for such a policy? Do you think that these, some of these people are even happy with the kind of states that they're living under? And we think that that's completely contradictory within the first minute of their first speaker. But on the third level, they also came up here and talked about how their uh, individuals might, the reason why individuals don't raise their voices is because they're scared. But let's tell you one thing. When you're going to be forcing such values within countries, those individuals that might have been carrying out discrimination initially will be even more angered now, ladies and gentlemen. Why? Because you're elevating the position of that discriminated minority, ladies and gentlemen. That minority will now be at a greater position. That's where they're angry, angry at those individuals, which mean, meaning that you're not solving the problem, you solve the problem that you're been solved from within your country. But fourth, it also came up here and talked about how in the past you realized yourself that there's a problem. So the problem is and you are not going to be able to realize such things now. But we tell you that the reason why you were able to realize all of this initially was because your people felt an need for it, which is why your people were ready to accept such policies, ladies and gentlemen. Show to us how it would even be possible for these people to accept such policies if it's not even coming from within them. If it's something they completely oppose at the end of the ladies and gentlemen. But on the second level, 
to be telling you that if the state did realize this, why do you think that the state was able to move away from such things and why do you think that not it's all going to happen now? You think that as time is progressing, you're actually moving towards a better world when you don't realize such things. We don't think that is even going to be a problem at the end of the day, which means that there needs fall there and then. But on the fourth level, they also talked about how you're, which is, by the way, their second line of argument and their positive base, which is extremely fine, by the way. The says that they're going to be better allies with countries now because they're going to have the same ideology. Let's look at it this way. United States of America is not a Shia country, but it did develop the nuclear deal with Iran. Iran, being a Shia country, was able to have good relations with USA by virtue of having different ideologies. Does that mean they weren't on good relations? Does that mean it did affect their relations? We did not. Therefore, the second line of argument falls there then. But let's move on to our own lines of argument today. We're going to be bringing forward three objections for you. No, thank you, sir. First, let's talk about how there is a different need in every single country. Which I that the kind of policies that you have are with regards to the kind of need that you have within these countries. So it's with, it's according to the kind of demand that your people have or with regards to the social political factors within every country. Which I that you might need democracy in an area where you feel several leaders will be able to handle a certain portion or where you feel several leaders will be able to impose the right kind of policies. But within an area where you have extreme kinds of violence taking place, where you think that the same kind of power will not be able to be dealt with by several leaders, you will not need something like democracy within those areas, ladies and gentlemen. We don't think that Western powers going out and imposing such policies in every Boy, single I country know. is the way you need to even go about it. But on the second level, we tell you that when you, we, 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 we're talking about how it increases the conflict within the status quo. Let's talk about the Iraq war in this scenario, ladies and gentlemen. How the United States of America went into Iraq to displace Saddam Hussein, who they thought was not a legitimate leader, and ended up creating an entire terrorist organization because of that. We tell you that these wars were spread under the excuse of spreading their own Western ideologies, Western ideologies that they assumed would be beneficial to every single country, but actually weren't, ladies and gentlemen. We tell you that it is things like these that lead to conflicts in the first place, which is exactly why these terrorist groups are against the United States of America in the first place because it destroyed their country for them. We tell you that even if these wars will not, even if it will not create wars, it will still hamper relations between those countries. And let's understand how. Because let's look at it this way. If you have the United States of America going in to spread these ideologies within Iran or within Saudi Arabia, you realize that these countries will not want this in the first place. It will not be in with the consent of the state in itself. So even if your individuals want this, your government that is going to be conducting relations with the United States of America, it is not something that it wants. So let's understand what happens as a result of this. The trade that you carry out within these countries, with the oligopoly these countries have of oil, etc., within the Middle East, is going to be destroyed. Why? Because you realize that these countries will not want to have good relations with a country that is supposed to impose its own, its own beliefs upon them, ladies and gentlemen. We tell you that it is not just going to affect the United States of America, the intervening country within this scenario, but all other Western nations, because this tagline now exists towards them that all of these countries want to implement their own ideas upon them. But on the third level, let's understand how even if, even this is a very big event, by the way, these countries want to implement these different policies on their own, they will not do it. Why? Because now the tagline exists that this policy of democracy or these policies of uh, LGBT rights is something that is Western, ladies and gentlemen. You already see that within Pakistan and within India, you want to move away from this Westernization, ladies and gentlemen, because you know the kind of effects Britain's colonization had upon you. So what happens now is that even if they think it is beneficial towards them, it is not something that they will move towards. In fact, we think this is going to be even more problematic for these countries because if they wanted to work upon this for themselves, it is not something they will even do. Because we think that this one is going to be counterproductive, because we think that we want to live in a world where we live in peaceful coexistence, vote for team closing government. Okay. With the permission of the The first fundamental problem with the government that is that they only choose to talk about all coercive hard power mechanisms of attempts to liberalize worlds, negating the fact that there is moderate power such as aid, negating the fact that there is soft power such as bilateral and multilateral diplomacy, public diplomacy, amnesties that you might as well have offered and debated upon. So that we think is a problem. Secondly, we say that this isn't only about retrospective assumptions and retrospective analysis of whether or not today in the ground realities of the existing world should you choose to abandon those policies or not. So we call them on the word all. 
Let's move on to the first idea of sovereignty. And this is a very minimal point, right? Okay. So in their model, if a country consents to you coming and helping them, which by the way might not always be the case that you use hard power just to liberalize people, something that I will also analyze. Well, if you come with consent, that's fine. But in the same instance where we tell you that sovereignty is not only something which a state can claim to have until and unless its people yeah. have interested their will and that will is being protected, they would have you watched from the sidelines and they are the fundamental reason why you couldn't have gone and invaded Syria to protect the Syrian populace through all that the Syrian populace has been through. And this was pre-ISIS by the way. So with this regards, sure, we say right. if you want consent, you can have consent. A, in every other instance, it's not to liberalize these countries that they're going, but even if a state is not giving us consent, yeah. and it's an oppressive regime, whereby we think now that people are calling up to you, because yes, you do, in the age of Facebook, get certain tweets, you get certain demands from these states to protect themselves, and we think by virtue of the very human values that you uphold, you do sign documents sure. which is responsibility to protect, you have to go and not wash from the sidelines while these people die. No, thank you. Let's move on to the idea of organic change. Firstly, when she talks about Saudi Arabia, we tell you that narratives are suppressed here. Are you against affirmative action and things such as free immigration as well? Also, so you are, no, thank you. And don't interject and don't touch me. Sit down. The fact of the matter is that because of the fact that these narratives have been suppressed, we say that the counter narratives were never really able to come up to the surface and which is why we think that soft powers and certain platforms that NGOs or other forms of interferences by these western liberal democracies might give you Sir. do help you enable the discourse and give them the amount of information and the debate that they've never had before. No thank you, have your seat. And even then we say if this inspires a revolution or even in certain instances gives rise to western liberal, not western liberal, Liberal policy matters at the end of the day, liberal political parties, then why is that so bad for you? Because at the end of the day, what we're saying is identity formation and association with ideas for any particular individual still lies with themselves, whether or not a state acts freely intervening into you or whether or not the states propagates they it want through them. other soft core platforms. No, thank you. So let's move on to the idea of the use of hard power. This is where major I refute the government bench. Firstly, we say economic sanctions on Iran were not there to liberalize Iran per se. They were actually to stop Iran from building its nuclear power program. And that is something that we've seen has helped us in able to get a diplomatic solution to this particular problem. So we don't really think that uh, this particular idea was there to liberalize Iran all over. The fact of the matter that Iran still upholds its ideology shows to you that if a society does not want to accept the society, they may as well reject it. That doesn't prove that West should abandon its foreign policies that aim to attempt and liberalize these particular states. Sit down. Moving on. We've already talked about interventions based on the R2B, right? But let's understand this. Power vacuums always existed in the Middle East. If you know what the narrative of Iran is, and by the way, it isn't pro Shia, it's pro people of Persia. I'm a Shia, I know that. It's pro people of Persia, then you know that these narratives have always yeah. been in clash, firstly, based on the ethnicity of Ajam and Arab, which was the Arab and the Persian people, but secondly, another reward of a Shia Sunni clash which the West, we don't think exacerbated, it always existed even before the West came into the Middle East propagating its own ideologies. So we think with that respect, power vacuums have always existed in these places and the Western liberalizing policies have not created your problem. No, thank you. But then, they have this amazing assumption, you know, that everyone will colonize the world again. We don't think that can happen under the current check and balances and under the current diplomatic veto powers such as the rise of Russia and China then leaving the counter share on these western liberal policies and western liberal countries that you can easily go and colonize every other state. So that's for their effect. But lastly, we say that if you want these people to catch up with you in terms of technology, in terms of discourse, in terms of academics, then why not ide ideologically? and help them liberalize if they want to, or even if they don't want to for that matter, propagate your ideas, because you already do that through soft powers, and that is something that we think is the West's right. No, thank you. So let's move on to our extensions, which will also refute much of what they have to say. Oh, no, not before that. <laughs> One more proof of why there is an existing power vacuum in the Middle East is the idea of partitioning of Iraq much before the idea of this war that happened because of the Shia Sunni domain. 
That particular issue shows us a lot that the Middle East has had its own problems and they weren't really exacerbated by the Western liberal policy that we had. Only they have issues of the euro, no thank you. Then, let's move on to our extension, sit down. And this is very important, right? The idea of financial mobility and what you get in our model in terms of globalization. Firstly, we say that these values were no thank you at least. Draw back to this, I'll sit down, I won't take it. Understand this idea. These values have been perfected in the West, but we don't say that these values are part of the West only. These are values that and principles that you uphold generally everywhere around the world, which is why they are important for you. The idea of individual. We say when your borders are getting thinner and thinner, and in our model, there's cross pollination, global solidarity platforms for people to get their individual narratives, whatever they might be, across the board. We think that is something that is beneficial. Another assumption that this is always the case that this is welcome. In many instances, it is. In many instances, it may not be does not tell you that the West should not use its policies. We further say that in their model, what you get is otherization. It's where you don't let the discourse happen. So let's talk about the first idea of financial mobility. Understand that your foreign aid is given through taxpayer money based on the very values that you have had. We can see in the example of Treaty of Versailles and the Nazis at the end of the day, because of the fact that there was no foreign aid given to them and their financial mobility rights, that is where they rebel. We don't think that the West can afford people to go against them in terms of this particular idea. We said fundamentally you need to allow this because if you allow NGOs and every other to bring their product from up to the face, then that is particularly important. Gives you the moral support to go against oppressive regimes. Because it allows not only for your discourse, the general idea of individualism that by the way doesn't confuse you because if you're subjective, you can choose your own individual identities. And because of the fact that this is important for the Western higher moral ground at the end of the day, both team close the <coughs> I'd like to thank the speaker for the speech and would now like to invite the government to deliver a speech not exceeding 10 minutes in time. This debate essentially boiled down to two major issues. The first one being whether or not this is morally justified to uh, abandon this, these foreign policies, and the second one being whether these policies are even beneficial to these countries in the first place. Moving on to the first issue, the first idea that we talked to you about over here was about how it contradicts the entire idea of liberalism. How countries within the status quo are often being coerced into believing these things by mechanisms such as sanctions, by mechanisms such as often intervening within these countries. The first response they had to this was that people are with people within conservative societies are being coerced to believe these things, and you need to give them the freedom to choose things. Gentlemen, we believe that this is something funny for them to say because they too are kind of imposing liberalism on these people, ladies and gentlemen. So they are also imposing a very ideology that they believe is not <clears throat> not right for them to do. So we believe that they're also they're, they're doing exactly what they believe is not correct for them to be doing. The second response they had to this was that people within your status quo are not given the freedom to choose. We believe they are given the freedom to choose even within what their borders. Thank you, sir. When they are allowed avenues, such as when they are allowed to vote in or vote out a specific government on the basis of their ideology, ladies and gentlemen, we believe if, if majority of people within these, so that you sir, majority of people within these societies had actually wanted the kind of change you're implying they do. Do you believe that this change would have already been brought about? The, the, uh, what they had to say to this was that, you know what, some people are born into particular families when they can't really make the choice. But, even, but then in your model, someone who's born into a liberal family would also not be able to make this choice, ladies and gentlemen. Someone born into a family with, with the kind of ideology you're saying will also not be able to... Uh, will also not be able to move away from the kind of from that kind of ideology, ladies and gentlemen. They then talked about how you're only talking about mechanisms such as war and sanctions. We believe this is because this is what most of the countries resort to. They then talked about how sanctions on Iran were not for the purpose of changing the kind of uh, for changing uh, for spreading Western ideologies. We believe that it, the purpose that it did serve at the end of the day was to improve democracy within, within Iran. The only reason because of which countries started negotiating with them or started moving to 
better in their relations with them. No, well, thank you both of you. Was because of the fact that Iran was moving towards a democracy. But moving on to the uh, but and what uh, another responsibility? Then another thing we talked about over here was that how you do have a responsibility to these countries. You have a responsibility to protect them. We believe that there's an inherent different difference between these two because the, the things like the responsibility to protect are based on humanitarian purposes. Like when there's mass atrocities being carried out in the West, when your state is actively doing something against its people, we believe that the kind of direct harm you're talking about within uh, things like the responsibility to protect is something that does not exist when you're intervening on the basis of the kind of ideology you have in India. Your ideology that we don't think leads to a uh, no, uh, no like so that your ideology which we do not think leads to the kind of harm you're talking about. But let's talk to you about the ideas they had to they had to bring forward. The first one was about how these countries have this responsibility that they themselves have taken upon themselves because of which which validates them going into other countries. We believe that just because these countries have taken this responsibility on themselves does not allow for them to be infringing upon other countries' engagement. And second, we believe a responsibility that leads to people leads to people intervening in other countries leads to massive damages being caused is a responsibility that we would much rather be abandoning within the status quo. So then talk about how Western countries need to fix what they've done, never proving to us why exactly this is the only way that they can be fixing the problems that they've caused, never exactly proving to us why these Western countries intervening le lead to, leads to all of the problems that exist right now. And we believe that if the, the reason that these problems exist right now is because of the fact that they intervene, is because of the fact that they, they took upon the responsibility of controlling all of these areas. If you take on that responsibility once again, what you're actually doing is allowing there for allowing for there to be room for these problems to, to exist again in the detriment. But because of which we believe that this issue for uh, this issue falls to deem proposition uh, close the government. But let's uh, moving on to the second issue. Over here we talked about how people how people these policies are generally associated the kind of policies have uh, historic no thank you sir historically have led to things like wars that have led to things like the Vietnam War, the Cold War, the uh, the war in Afghanistan and Iraq etc. Because of which if you continue to have these policies, the, these these uh, countries the uh, countries where people within the conservative societies are generally going to associate all of these Western countries with the action that they carried out in the past. No thank you sir. Because what the, what we believe this will lead to in the in the future is that you're going to hamper any kind of change towards things like democracy being brought about because of the fact that it's going to be associate, associated with a violent past state development because it's something that's simply going to be shunned away and especially even more so now now that this change is coming out because of an entirely foreign nation development we believe that this is something that they did not have a response to but let's talk, no, thank you, sir. But let's talk about the ideas that they had to bring forward first the first one about how you, this is going to end up better in relations because now that a lot of countries have the same ideologies, you will be able to make allies with them. We believe that historically this is not something that has been successful. Imposing your ideology onto other countries has not led to them being willing to negotiate with you more. In fact, what we believe that this has led to is it being counterproductive. But these people do not actually want to, within the international sphere, want to interact with these countries. On a third level, we believe that good relations is not something that just exists because of two countries having the same ideology. We see this when you see this in the we see this in a lot of cases. When you see in countries, uh, when you see a lot of countries who do still interact and who are still willing to move forward even though they may not have the same ideologies. And the third thing we have to talk about over here is that you, know, you have examples like Russia and China which can keep the Western countries in check. We believe it's over here that we're actually conceding to the fact that you need conservative societies within the status quo to keep the liberal uh, to keep this liberal ideology in check. We believe they've conceded to the entire principle that uh, that the uh, government as a whole has talked to you about. How you need inherently conservative societies are inherent to your status quo, ladies and gentlemen. How even within liberal societies, you have things like conservative um, you have things like conservative society, conservative communities that are existing, and you accept the, you accept them because you understand the fact that liberalism has inherently been allowing people to choose for themselves, ladies and gentlemen. So for the side that actually allows these, uh, this change to be to be coming up about on its own, for the side that is not forcing any sort of ideology onto its people, be it, uh, conservative, be, it, be it conservatism or liberalism, we believe the closing government deserves to win. <laughs> I like the Chinese speaker for his speech, I'm not like the
the opposition went through the resolution on exceeding seven minutes. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
they are uh, global competitors as far as your ideologies are concerned as a, as far as your interests are concerned and we believe the us and west should as an important stakeholder should propagate its ideologies to maximize its, its interests because we believe that in today's world we do not live in a unidimensional or a unipolar world when there are certain other powers which are trying to dominate the world and trying to sway all these people living in the middle east living in south asian region why don't you go there and preemptively act for your own interests give us one logic for that and you know what that if, even if they come uh, with the principle of liberalism we say all right when shahkar said that if these people don't want these values and if these states do not want these values why they should reject it if you say that they those people will reject those values as iran or cuba did what the, uh, what is that problem that you have with west to propagate them through soft Sir. channels right we say that the whole debate that was secret to was us intervention going on there with with militaries we say shakar pointed out that how there are certain different ways through which you propagate these values through ngos through amnesties through us aid through your uh, bilateral democracies or uh, bilateral diplomacies Sir. we say that how why do you have a problem with all these measures why do you have a problem with an attempt by us to do all these things we don't understand any attack came from that side so you know what that coercion is necessarily a bad thing we say well that why do you have a policy to coercively go in those states that you by un declare rogue states and the same un that have a generalized and universalized principle or universal human charter and all these 240 states that have ascribed to that universal human charter and have participated in the un if the states from uh, if the legitimate states from all these countries have agreed to that generalized human rights charter if there is a certain uh, resenting uh, terrorist or extremist tendency to think that whose uh, value should be considered more the state that have agreed to the universal human charter or the resenting uh, uh, extremist tendencies at the same that stage we say that yes you should go and uh, you know actively or passively implement or uh, pro- propagate these things and really this is also an assumption that how in every other case scenario the uh, country that is going to receive these values will reject it you consider the case of japan how when us through a soft channeling and through soft pro- propagation uh, propagated these liberal ideologies the world accepted that and we believe that by the end of the day progress to it and you know what the last idea that is said that all right there is a certain minority or majority of people who do have a problem with these oppressive states you do what you let them migrate well the whole idea of immigration crisis that you still have in europe and the all the hurts that were inculcated by when you allowed the people of cuba to migrate why because you do have a problem you didn't have a problem with people cross so all those hurts that were inculcated to the american society by the end of the day we don't want that we say that let them be more comfortable in their home by making it more comfortable for them through soft channeling or if force is needed thank you किसी को बीपी डिबेट तक नहीं सही नहीं करनी आती पाकिस्तान में 